welcome friends to this afternoon session of our three day program here i was wondering why people feel that other people are dying but we will not die i have never come across a person who says i think i am going to die that and yet everybody dies the physical body everybody dies we see other people dying yet doesn't occur to us we might die suddenly any time what is preventing us from realizing all the time that one day we will die that this body is very temporary and we have to leave it in india there are yogis who wear saffron colored robes some of them don't know why they wear but the old ones know why they are wearing saffron colored robes that's the color of fire it is to remind them every day that one day this body will be cremated in fire just to remind them that this is temporary what you are wearing and don't bank on this body for too long it's going to go away that they need a reminder that people need a reminder that one day we will die looks odd to me we see people dying all around us at my age i have seen more people dying than most of you have seen and yet i think maybe i can make an investment today in a bond that will give me yield after 10 years <laughs> i see old people of my age in their late 80s trying to make investments for 10 years and they don't in one second they can die what is it in us that makes us feel that other people can die but not us the real reason for that is that we never die the real reason is that the consciousness which is making us feel that we will never die is telling us the truth that we will never die because we never die the body dies the death of the body is merely casting off a particular clothing we are wearing just one of the garments one of the covers upon ourselves it's one of several covers but inside these covers we never die the self of which i spoke in the morning never dies it doesn't die because it was never born it's a very difficult concept impossible for the mind to visualize when did we come into being when did our soul come into being we say once upon a time you cannot say once upon a time when no time exists you can say once upon a time when you are in a time frame the time frame doesn't start till we get a mind and start using it one of the garments we put on a mind on ourselves we put a sensory perception on ourselves we put a physical body on ourselves and time is everything for us time is the only thing that keeps moving whether you like it or not time becomes our master time becomes our destiny time becomes our trap the biggest trap the biggest trap we ever had was time and we can't think outside of time it's impossible for the mind to visualize to contemplate to conceptualize what it would be like if there was no time people tell me that there is one time where there is no time and it's called now i was surprised that there is no time in now that now is timeless and we are all living in now all the time somebody gave me a book to read the power of now how you can live in the now and my question was where else are we living i have never met anybody who's not living in the now i don't know anybody who has the capacity to live anywhere out, outside of now they don't even have the capacity to go outside of now and yet now has no time now they say is a meeting point between the past and the future it has no time even a billionth part of a nanosecond is time before i can utter the word now it's past before i uttered it it was future it never stopped it didn't hold on at now it became the past and all i could do was to recall it from my memory because you can't experience the past except through memory we have not been gifted with any other vision 
any other method of looking at the past except through memory. We remember things. We can relive them by remembering visuals. We can remember words. We can remember events. But we remember. We use memory for that. The past is accessible only through memory. And memory means it's not happening now. It happened earlier. That's why we remember it. So past is already gone. What about future? At least there is something we can in store for us, our destiny, backed up in the future. And maybe future is flowing and the experience of events flowing from the future are constituting our present. Not at all. If we did not have the capacity in reason to hope, to fear, or to anticipate, there would be no future. Did you ever realize that future, what we call future, is a function of these three functions of consciousness? We hope for things, we create a future. We are afraid of things, we create a future. We anticipate this will happen like that, we create a future. And these three things are not different. They are all anticipation. Anticipation of something good we call hope. Anticipation of something which is not so good we call fear. And what is neutral we call anticipation. It's the same thing. It's a function of the mind that creates a future. In order to hope, in order to fear, in order to anticipate, we need time. Doesn't matter if it's a second or more. And that leads us again into the past. Think of it very scientifically and you will find that whatever we have called future was indeed the past. Because we had to create the future by hoping, anticipating and fearing which were all taking place in time, therefore they were the past. No, now had no, no time at all. So now is a very strange situation that we are all living in a timeless state. Then how come it doesn't look like that at all? There is something happening which makes us feel we are living in the present. The present is merely a rapid, visual, multidimensional recollection of the immediate past. That's what we call present. There's no other present. When we say, when was this world created? And I give an honest answer now. It's an honest answer. Because there is nothing else. Without time, there is nothing else except now. If we go beyond the mind, what time frame will we go into? We will go into now. Therefore, when we say we apply the rules of worldly time, we apply the rules of beginning, middle and end, which were merely conveniences created to pack events into. The creation by mind of beginning, middle and end, which we have given several names, including names of gods, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, India. Who are these gods? They are merely to represent that time exists. And the beginning we call Brahma and this middle portion we call Vishnu and the end we call Shiva. We have given all kinds of names to these trinities because trinities create time. The experience of time that we are having is a very valuable thing for this kind of experience. It's a very valuable thing for having a non-body Ethereal body experience is also a very useful thing to have a pure mental experience. They all take place in time with one difference. In the physical body, with this cover on, we deny to ourselves any other experience of time except the physical time. And this physical time is not governed by our experience but by our watches and clocks. That's another big trap. Supposing I'm having a good time having nice coffee with a friend, and I say, well, it's only 15 minutes have passed. I look at my watch, one hour. Oh, sorry, I didn't know one hour has passed. My experience was not one hour. My experience was 15 minutes. I believe the watch and not my experience. They're trapped. On the other hand, we sit for meditation. I want to sit for meditation for two and a half hours. It looks like three hours. And I look at the watch, 15 minutes. <laughs> No, I thought it was two and a half or three hours. A friend of mine who was a regular meditator lived in San Francisco many years ago and invited me to come and visit him. So I came and stayed with him. 
and he said, very good, Ishwar, you are old disciple of great master, must have done a lot of meditation. I had to bite my tongue when he said that. And therefore, let's meditate together in the morning. I said, I said, well, I, don't, I wanted to sleep really. But he said, no, three o'clock meditation time. So to keep up faces, I had to get up at three o'clock also with him. And we both got up and all in regular position, we squatted round, closed our eyes. At three o'clock sharp, we started two and a half hours of meditation. Now, frankly speaking, I am not a good meditator because time and again my curiosity took the better hold of me to see what he is doing. So I opened the corner of my eye to see what he is doing. By coincidence, every time I opened my eye to see, he was looking at his watch. After 15-20 minutes, I said, let me see now what's going on. He was just doing very nicely. After two, and, we sat two and a half hours like that. And then he said, oh, it was a very nice meditation session. I said, it was, my friend. The only difference is you were not meditating at the third eye center. You were not meditating on your beloved master. You were not meditating on anything spiritual. You were meditating on your watch. When we are so conscious of how much time we are spending, do you think you can pull attention inside like that? Haven't we made it into a ritual already? That this is the nature of a trap around us, that we are caught up so much in this time frame. People say, do two and a half hours of meditation. Supposing I were watching my watch for five hours, it meant nothing. And supposing for five minutes, my beloved master appears and pulls me inside and says, let's fly. Those five minutes will be more valuable then two and a half hours looking at the watch. It's not the quantum, quantum, it's not the quantity, it's the quality of meditation that counts. Great Master explained to one of his questioners who asked how much is good meditation so that I can do the right time, right type of and right time of meditation. Great Master said, in this world, in this life, a day and night consists of 24 hours. How much time are we giving to meditation? Supposing you decide to give one-tenth based on the old system that the tithes that the charity you give should be one-tenth of your net income. Let's say you give one-tenth of your total time every day available, every day and night. It'll be about two and a half hours. If you spend two and a half hours on meditation and spend 21 and a half hours on other things, where will the scale tilt to other things? It's not enough. Two and a half hours is not enough because you are spending far more time on other things than what you are spending on the real thing of meditation. <clears throat> then, Master, how much should we do? He says, ideally, great Master says, ideally, you should meditate for 21 and a half hours and do other things for two and a half hours. That's the ideal way. Master, how can we do 21 and a half hours? We have other things to do in this world. We have jobs to do, food to cook, work to do, travel, all those things we have to do. How can we do 21 and a half hours? He said, actually, it's very simple. If the work you do, you say you are doing that work not because of earning a livelihood or because you have to do it, but because you want to do it because Master says do it. It's meditation. If you can associate your master to any work you are doing, it can counts equal to meditation. Because meditation is the art of pulling your attention and you are focusing attention while doing work on something that will help you when you sit inside for two and a half hours. If you are thinking of the master, if you are doing your simulant, your repetition, while walking, cooking, doing your chores, daily chores, <laughs> If all the time you're doing Simran and remembering your face of your beloved master, it's as good as meditation. Great master's own grandson, Parshottam Singh, joined the army and he was stationed somewhere about 100 miles away from the Dera. And one day he comes to great master, who was also his grandfather and also uh, his master. He said, master, 
I had decided my life will be dedicated to you. I'll sit near your feet and do meditation. And that will be my life. But where have you sent me in destiny to join a military camp somewhere? I'm so far away, can't come and see you. I think I should resign my job and come and sit at your feet and be devoted to you. Great Master said, go back and join your unit. When you do any work in that job, think you are doing for Master, it's as good as meditation. And better than sitting in my feet and thinking of other things. He explained, meditation is, is not, not merely a ritual. We make it into a ritual. Meditation is what we should continue all the time. Every time you remember your beloved, you are in love. It's meditation. Every time you can think of that master of yours, it's meditation. When you miss your master, is it not meditation? Is it not the growth of love and devotion in you? How would you miss your master? Therefore, if we are doing this all the day, all day's work, with continuous repetition of our Simran, with thought of our master, remembering his face, remembering small events that have happened with him. If you are doing that, it's equivalent to meditation. It prepares you for future journey as much as sitting down with your eyes closed would do. Therefore, meditation has to be done all the time. What about night time when we sleep? Great master explained, if you do meditation for half an hour, just before you sleep. That meditation will continue during your sleep. Supposing you are repeating the Simran, the words, for half an hour just before sleeping. And you wake up in the middle of the night, you'll find you're still repeating that. Repetition of words is to control the mind, not to think of other things, and can be made into a habit. Repetition of words, the mantras, is not necessarily to lead you anywhere, it's a for local use. It is only for use, meditation by repetition of words takes you nowhere beyond the astral plane. It does not take you beyond the mind at all. It's a mental function to repeat words. But the repetition of words, when we make it a habit, which we can do by trying to repeat all the time. If you make it a habit, it becomes very easy. Repetition requires no effort at all. It becomes a habit of the mind. And you know the mind is habit-forming, all, always habit-forming. It forms one habit after another. If you make a habit of repeating the words and you go to sleep, after half an hour of meditation on words, the words continue throughout the night. When you wake up in the morning, you are still meditating. Therefore, great master said, if you follow this, what about the missing two and a half hours? You said you should do two, 21 and a half hours. This way you can do 24 hours. Great Master said, no, I'm allowing for some two and a half hours when your mind and attention is required for some important paperwork or some important meeting where you have to give your attention. That is normally not more than two and a half hours. The rest is routine. So he gave a tip on how to do meditation for 21 and a half hours. Otherwise, we are trapped in time. Events have been loaded into this time and we are being dragged by those events through attachments, desires. There's nothing that binds us here except desire leading to attachment. We get attached. Then we can't get rid of that thought. If you want to know who you are attached to, what your attachments are, try meditation. It's a very good way. When you try to sit behind the eyes, all those things will come back and pull you out. It's like being tied down by ropes all over. You see so many strings tying you out. This one pulls you, then this one pulls you. You try to pull back. You say, no, no, I want to meditate. I don't want to remember this. That's such a sad situation when we have to fight the mind like that. Because supposing all the time you say, my mind is trying to think of other things. I want to bring it back to meditation. I start my repetition. I start my simran. The mind starts thinking something else and I am not repeating. I suddenly find out I'm not repeating the words. I'm thinking of something else. And I say, no more. And I start repeating again. Then the mind comes and pulls something else. And I find after a few seconds, for a few minutes, I'm not repeating the words at all. I pull it back and fight the mind. If this is the style of meditation we're having, 
what will happen after two and a half hours? We'll be totally tired and exhausted because we did such a big battle. We thought we won every battle with the mind and yet we lost the war. We lost the war because we spent all our time fighting. So it has a very limited role to fight with the mind. It's a limited role till we can convince ourselves that there is something worth looking for. When we say there's something worth looking for and we explore the space inside, not only repeat like a parrot, but repeat in order to not think of other things as much as possible and explore what is happening inside. Go around, fly, look up, look on the side, stay in the center. If we start doing that, we get some visions, some experiences. We, stars come up, colors come up, different kind of experiences come up, waterfalls consisting of lights come up, simple experiences start coming up. Illuminated experiences come up. We see buildings lit up with, with light. We see we are flying over some land. All those little little experiences make it interesting to stay there. That is necessary. That, does, that takes away the fight with the mind. Meditation should be treated as if it is a scientific exploration of the space inside your head behind the eyes. If that is not done, then we are making it a ritual. Then what's the difference between going to a temple or a church or a synagogue and just attending service and come back the same way we went? Instead of going that, we are now doing two and a half hours. Some willy-nilly, somehow we are doing it. What are you doing it for? You're not obliging anybody by doing that. You're supposed to do it to get something out of it. And to get something out of it, understand why we are doing it. We are doing it because our attention has been thrown outside. And we are unable to look what is happening inside. If we do happen to look inside, strange things happen better than just flashes of light or flashes of color. You are able to pull inside. You find you have another body of yours. A totally different body. A body that does not follow the laws of physical nature. Just like a dream, which is a lower state of level of consciousness. It looks like a lower state of level of consciousness. Just like when we go to dream, the laws that operate a dream do not apply to the physical world. For example, in a dream you can fall off from a cliff and you don't get hurt. In a dream you can be in one location, you can be in Los Angeles today and you can be in Chicago one second later, it looks normal in a dream. It doesn't look normal here at all. Therefore, the laws that control the experiences at different level are different. When you withdraw your attention to your astral self, you find the laws are different. Even the time is different. Even the nature of time is different. Here, time is completely out of your control. You cannot hold even a nanosecond. It flows. It looks like time flies. Or maybe you are flying over time and time is static. Or maybe time is flowing, you are static, something is happening, but you have no control over it. At least in the astral plane, you have some control over it. You can hold a particular experience for as long as you like. You can't do that here. The nature of time is different. Time still flows. Events still come the same way. Because when we talk of an astral self, when we say we have an astral body inside this body and when we leave the physical body, we go to astral body. What is the astral body made up of? Have you ever contemplated what is that body? This body we know is made of these cells and substances and, and, and blood and skin and tissues. We know what this body is made of. Do we know what the astral body is made up? The astral body is made up only of sense perceptions and there is nothing else in it. It has the capacity to have all the sense perceptions we are having in the physical body, except they are much sharper. Because the cover upon the sense perceptions is not there, and this body provides a cover upon them, and we see through the physical system. The sense perceptions per se are the astral body. Therefore, the astral body takes the same shape as this, because we are using the same shape of this body to experience our sense perceptions our tactile sense, our sense of smell, uh, the way it's located on the physical body 
appears to be the same base located there and looks like it's an overlap. We would not be able to have any sense perceptions if we did not have an astral body. When we say we are seeing something, we are actually seeing with the astral body through a cover, through the lenses of the physical body. If that were not there, we wouldn't see. We wouldn't be able to touch. We wouldn't be able to do anything that we call sense perception. Astral body is made up of sense perceptions and provides the sense perceptions through the physical body to the extent it can. If your eyes get busty, your lenses get dark, and you are, you've got, got cataract and you can't see clearly, it's a physical ailment. It's not an astral ailment. A person who has this problem, when he meditates and goes into the astral body, he has better than 20-20 clear vision. Everything so, looks so clear there. The rules that apply to that state are different than the rules that apply here. Time is one of the factors where you can check that you can stop time, stop an event which you can't do here. But you can go further. Supposing you withdraw your attention from the astral self and go to the inner self, which is the creative self, the causal self, which has caused all experience to take place, which has created time and space, which has created everything, which has created the universal mind, which has created all that the mind can ever imagine, which has been worshipped as the ultimate creator by most of the people, including the, including the gurus and masters and yogis. They have called that the ultimate stage. Because there's nothing more than you can visualize, aspire for, desire for, seek for, than that, with your mind. When you reach that state, you wonder what is that made of? We have left our physical body. At least the awareness of it we have left behind. We have left the awareness of sense perceptions behind. What are we having the awareness of now? We are having awareness of direct perception, of concepts, of things that make up things. We are able to experience that with that causal self. What is the causal self? What's the substance that makes the causal self? It's nothing but our own mind. The mind is the causal self. It's not there's a body in which we have a mind. The mind is the body. The mind is the causal self and creates everything. That has no form because it does not operate either in the astral self or in the physical self through these forms. Therefore, it's formless. We create a form for the sake of experience, and you can create any form. But we create a sort of formless form with it, and we, our speed of flight, our speed of experience is so rapid. It's the most rapid speed of experience you can ever have. And that is only because it's the speed at which the mind can think. Thinking is one of the functions of the mind. Thinking is a function of the causal body. Thinking is like a heartbeat of this physical body. This physical body survives on heartbeats. It survives with the blood circulating, carrying all the nutrition everywhere. Otherwise, the body doesn't last. Like that, thoughts, the thinking process, the process of continuously speaking out, either in words, language, or otherwise. That's the function of the mind, and without that it dies. Therefore, even in the physical body, when you think of your mind, it'll always be speaking. It's the greatest speaker. It's an endless speaker. It speaks continuously. There's no way you can stop it. I have yet to meet a person, because we constantly talk of stilling the mind. Unless you still your mind, you can't get anything. How do you still your mind? There was a colleague of mine at Harvard University who said he had succeeded in stopping the mind from thinking. I was very impressed. That at least I am meeting one guy who says he knows how to stop thinking. He has some performed some asanas, some kind of yoga he has done by which he can control the thinking mind and stop thinking. So I invited him to my apartment to demonstrate if he can really stop thinking. And what happens? My interest was to find out what happens to consciousness, what happens to a living person who says he's not thinking for a certain period of time. What happens? So he came up and I said, how long can you stop thinking? He said about half an hour or so easily. He said, how about doing it for one minute? 60 seconds. If you can do it for 60 seconds, I'll believe you can do it forever. You must have found some art. 
So he sat down to demonstrate. And I said, then you don't stop thinking any time. When I tell you, then you stop thinking because you know how to do it. I told him, I'll clap my hand and start looking at my stopwatch. When I clap my hand, you stop thinking. And after 60 seconds, I will clap again. Then you start thinking. Then we will examine from your personal experience what happened to you while you were not thinking. It's going to be great search, great survey for me, a great study for me to find out what happens when a person does not think. So he got into an asana. He contorted his body in a certain way, which we mostly do in yogic exercises. And then he was all ready. So when I saw he was ready, I clapped and looked at my watch. After 60 seconds, I clapped again. I said, now tell me what happened when I clapped. He said, I stopped thinking. I said, when I clapped, how did you know that's the time to stop thinking? I said, don't make up a story. <laughs> tell me exactly what happened in your head. He said, when you clapped, I said, this is the time to stop thinking. I said, that's a thought. He said, but it only took a couple of seconds, two, three seconds only. I just thought that I have to stop thinking. Then I stopped. I said, okay, experiment is narrowed down now to 57 seconds. Two, three seconds, but still thought. Now tell me, when you stop thinking, how did you know that when I clap again, you can start thinking again? Don't make a story. Again, remember, personally remember what happened. So, oh, now I recall, after I said, this clap means I have to stop thinking. And when he claps again, I will th start thinking again. I said, I have another thought. In about 10 minutes, we analyzed what happened. And continuously, he had to program himself to start thinking when I clap again. Continuously, he was saying these things to himself. And then at the end of our little discussion on what happened in those one, 30, 60 seconds, he caught his head. He said, oh my God, I never thought so much ever before then in the 60 seconds. The point I'm making is nobody has been able to stop thinking you will die. The mind will die, the senses will die, the body will die if you stop thinking. It's a lifeline. Therefore, when we say still your mind, or you say don't apply your mind to thoughts that are taking you away, what it means is, ignore your mind. It does not mean the mind will stop its function. When we say, withdraw your attention from this body, it does not mean kill your body. It means, let the bodies go, don't put your attention on it. When you say, withdraw your attention from the mind, it means, not stop thinking, don't put your attention on the thought. Pull away from the attention on the thought. And that's a very difficult practice. But that is what takes you beyond the mind. There has to be a power to pull you off from your mind in order to ignore the mind. Fortunately, that power exists in all of us. The power of love. The power of love operates from there. Do you know the only time when we really ignore what we are thinking is when we are in love? That pulls us. Love and devotion go together. We don't know what love is. We are calling attachment as love. All the things we are attached to, we call it love. Love is not something that we project or we give to anybody. Love is what pulls us. Love is a pull. Love, the Persian mystic says, Ishq avval dar dile ma shuk paida mishavad. That means love is first born in the heart of the beloved. If the beloved doesn't pull you, you don't experience love. So love is always a pull. And it is the unconditional love that comes to us from a perfect living master that pulls us. Actually, it pulls us beyond our reason. Even when our mind is arguing against it, it still pulls us. It's the only thing that beats the mind. It's the only thing that enables us to ignore the mind in meditation. Therefore, then why do we say love and devotion? Why don't we stop at say love that pulls? Because devotion is a response to that love. When we are pulled by love, we feel devoted. And devotion is an expression, the best expression we can have 
towards that pole which we call love. That's why love and devotion go together. When unconditional love pulls us, our devotion responds to it. And we feel happy as one. And we feel both go together. These are the things that will really take us out of this and show us what is immortal. This is not immortal. This physical body is very, very temporary. We see others going. We we'll also go. Everybody is gone. So many masters came. They have gone. So many great philosophers came. They have gone. Nobody stayed in the physical body forever. We we'll also go like anybody else. It's a temporary thing. Very useful thing, but temporary. It's a, like a useful garment given to us for a wedding or something. So we wear that wedding suit. The wedding is over. We are wearing this beautiful human body and it has certain benefits no other form has. The human body given to us for a little limited time to an immortal soul, to a soul that does not know anything about death and birth, does not know anything about time as we know it. This is beyond time. That soul gets embedded into a physical body. And what's the big advantage? This physical body with the physical mind in it, the mind that's operating at physical level, we call physical mind. The astral mind and the causal mind all operating within this physical body creates a great feeling that we can make our own choice. That we have free will. That we can decide what to do or not. That destiny is being made by us right now. That we decide whether we'll go out tomorrow or not. There is no such thing as pre-written destiny because we can change. Our mind can change. And therefore, the experience of free will is real in this physical world. And it's not real anywhere else. That's the beauty. It's not real in any other form. It's not real at any other level. The only level where free will is real is our absolute top level where is only one. And that free will created the whole universe including our free will. And that was our own true self. There are only two places in this entire spiritual structure of the creation of this universe where we can experience free will in the human body and as a creator of the whole universe. No other place. All other places are bound by programs we run through. Other forms of life we run through our instincts and we run through built-in reactions to everything, all pre-programmed. People are even wondering how much of our pre-programmed destiny we can find out by better study of the DNA molecule. Today, genetic studies are going on, genome studies are going on to tell us we can predict so many events of life which we thought were based upon our free will. In course of time, you'll find out more and more that we can discover through science how little real free will we have. But that doesn't matter. We have no real free will. That's not the real thing. The real thing is we feel we have. And this feeling we have free will enables us to have the feeling we are a seeker. If we can make a decision to go this way, we can also make a decision to go on the spiritual way. This feeling, this experience we have that we can be on a spiritual path is the key to finding the spiritual path, is the key to finding a perfect living master. This experience of free will that you can decide your course of action and therefore you can decide even the spiritual course of action. That's the key. And the key is responded in our physical life by the appearance of a perfect living master in our life. People say, how can we find a perfect living master? My answer is always a standard answer. Seek him inside you. He'll come to you. You don't have to run around. Coincidences will bring him to you. Different circumstances of life will bring him to you. If he is a perfect living master, a human being like ourselves, is a perfect living master and doesn't know we are a seeker, how can he be a master? If he is our master, if we are on his list who he is going to take us back to our true home and doesn't even know where we are, doesn't even know where we are seeking, how can he be our master? A perfect living master is one who finds us. Not that we run around finding him. He may put us through a search because of our mind. Our mind loves to search. Our mind loves to struggle and find. Okay, go through this and I'll appear at the right time. Which he does. So the way to find a perfect living master is to be ready. 
to seek within yourself. A master will come. And how will you know? Who is a who is your master? There are so many masters around. Great master used to say, in India, the number of masters has grown so much that now there are more masters than disciples. This, this breed of masters has spread very quickly. So how do we know who is a perfect living master? The answer to that question is that the master who will pull you with his unconditional love is your master and he will take you up. There can be masters who are perfect living masters but may not take you up because you are not ready for that time. They may even initiate you. They may initiate you in preparation for the next life. Then you will meet the master who is the master who will pull you and take you up. These are internal things it is only in the manual for masters that I'm quoting from. That the manual of masters says that there can be masters and this may not be your last life. Then he is a master who has put you on track. But within four lives from that date, you will find a master who will take you back home. The good thing about this is, according to the theoretical model we have about master's work, that when a master, perfect living master initiates us, he guarantees that a master, perfect living master, will take you back home within four lifetimes. People, when I came to this country, United States, the beginning, everybody I met thought they were in their first life and were waiting for four lives. I said, how do you know this is your first life or second life or third or fourth or fifth? You should be able to know from your own progress because in the first life, you hardly develop the seeking to be found. In the second life, you are dedicated. The love flows automatically. Devotion flows automatically. Third life, you made almost so much progress that very quickly you find a master and you are having experiences inside. Therefore, you can't know which, which life you are living in. But when a master pulls you with his love and takes you in, that's generally the final life that you have. The master will take you in. My, my father, who was a good disciple of great master, once heard that great master has said in one of his satsangs that a person initiated by a perfect living master will not have to have more than four lifetimes of human life. Each one will be a human life, except very rare exceptions. And each one will be better and more conducive to meditation. So each life will be better because... Even initiation by a perfect living master, who is not your final master, destroys your sinchit karm, the reserve karma you have. And therefore, your next life is only built upon the karma of that one life. And that's never so much that to create too much karma, negative karma in the future. So every life turns out to be better than the previous one. So he heard that great master said that there will be no more than four lives. He couldn't attend that satsang. He couldn't attend that discourse. So in the evening, he went to the master's house. He said, I missed the satsang today. But somebody told me that in that meeting, you said a perfect living master, once he initiates a person, he will not have more than four human lives. And they'll all be one better than the other. Is that true? Great master said, Lake Raj, that was my father's name. Lake Raj, why are you worried? This is your last life. Why are you asking this question? You are on your last life. You will not come back again. He said, Master, I asked this question. That supposing I want more than four lives. You're putting a restriction. I thought that if the master keeps coming here, I should keep coming too. And can you guarantee that you will not come alone and leave me behind in such cunt, pining for you? Master laughed. And he said, Look, we say four lives. It does not mean that everybody is going to get four lives. If a person, after initiation by a perfect living master, follows his instructions as best as he can, that is his last life. Guaranteed. If a person, if initiated by a perfect living master, cannot follow those instructions, feels short, feels, I wish I could do better, feels he has not done enough of homework required by the master, he may come for the second life. But in the second life, he may come. If a 
person initiated by a perfect living master out of his grace because of his readiness but not yet fully preparedness to do what is required he is initiated by a master and leaves the path and says no 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 i was just it was a hoax it was just not real uh, the masters are not real this path is all made up by psychologists and so on and they just say these are all visions that we get just by blood pressure or something if that is the case that person may come on the third life if a person not only leaves the path but goes against the master works against him even crucifies him he may come for the fourth time so don't think there's a rule that we all have to be here for four lives most of us will go the same life if we just follow the instructions so don't take it too seriously that's what great master is explaining they don't take it too seriously that we have to be here for so long when we are ready to go the readiness to go comes from inside our heart and we feel it as seekers we feel it when we feel we are ready to go that readiness comes inside us master can see it masters can see that readiness and that's when they decide to initiate to take responsibility for that person why i'm mentioning this is because often there's a mistake that we all have to stay for four lives and who is our master the master who initiates us was the perfect living master he died i died too then what happened i am reborn reincarnated master is gone he is not going to come back then what what do i do is there another master there masters are not different what is the real substance of which masters are made of are they just human being like us they are human bodies are just like us their human sense perceptions are just like us their minds are just like us the souls are just like us then what's the difference what's the difference between such a human being ordinary human being and a perfect living master the difference is in the level of their consciousness the difference is what they're conscious of at all times that's the difference they know the difference so when a perfect living master is in a human form here his consciousness is connected continuously with all levels of creation and with the creator at all times not like us where we have to say let's do meditation and find one level Let, let's go more deeper meditation go to second level any one of us can be like a master if we go to the top we are identical with masters the equipment of spiritual search of spiritual ability to go to the top exist equally in all of us there nobody can say i am more blessed than the other person because i was born here or i was born there or i am wearing these colors of clothes or that i am wearing this color of skin this is white or brown or black or yellow doesn't matter what the color of the skin is the equipment provided to a human being is identical in a way we are all potential masters we are all potential perfect living masters we have the same capacity in us as but ours is latent and we are sleeping in it we are not aware of it the spiritual journey is not a journey in the sense that you have to go anywhere when we are dreaming and want to wake up do we say let me wake up sometimes it looks like a journey some of you might have had dreams in which you found out it was a dream and you said i know i am dreaming i know i am sleeping somewhere i have to go and find my body where i am sleeping and i run and wake up there we run in the dream when we wake up we find we went nowhere even the dream took place exactly where we were lying there was no real journey performed in the same way when we rise from one level of awakening to another we find we went nowhere the whole show of all levels of consciousness is taking place right in our home where we want to be we didn't leave our home we left the awareness of it the spiritual path is not a journey in that sense it's a path where you awaken from one level to another and discover your true home where you always were the whole show took place there so it's a discovery of awareness higher and higher awareness it's not that you go somewhere but we make it look like a journey why because we apply the rules of consciousness at the level where we are in physical level we want to go to a temple we walk we want to go to meditation we go to meditation workshop we want to attend the lecture we go there everything is a journey here 
Therefore, we think it's a journey there too. But that's not a journey, it's a wakefulness, it's awakening. Repeated awakening till we find out there was only one dreamer at the beginning. These are simple tips and that self of ours, always immortal, is bound down by covers which give us mortality. And why we feel we are immortal is because we are immortal. And you can find it out. I love the path of these perfect living masters because it's a practical path. You can use it and verify it now. It does not say, do this in the next life you'll be rewarded. It does not say, when you die, you reach heaven. It does not say you'll find the truth after you leave the body. It says you can do it right now. You can even experience the actual experience of vacating the body, of dying while you are living. Dying while living enables us to see what will come before we die. There are some side benefits, side advantages. I call them side perks of meditation. And one of them is you lose all fear of death to start with. We are all afraid of death and then we lose all fear of death because we have seen it, what it is like. Secondly, if you meditate more, you, you lose all fear, period. There's nothing to be afraid of. If you meditate more, you lose all doubt. There's nothing to be doubtful about. Certainty comes upon you for everything. So it's, it's amazing these side benefits that we get even by partial meditation. Even not going all the way back, we get so many benefits. I'm not saying this to induce you into meditation. I'm only saying that these things happen. And they happen, they add to the flavor of the spiritual path. I love a spiritual path in which we can rejoice, enjoy, and not only enjoy what's inside, begin to enjoy what is outside. We were not brought into this world to suffer. We were brought into this world to watch this movie, this drama, and sit in the audience behind our eyes and enjoy it. We didn't come here to get settled in here. We came to this carnival to have a ride, enjoy it, and go back home in the evening. And we get trapped into this. Well, there's a way out. When we left our home into this awareness, did we make a mistake, some kind of a mistake, that we said, we just want to go for an adventure. We just want to go for some new experiences and then forgot all the way how to go back? I don't think we could be that stupid that we couldn't even know that we might get tra trapped here. No, we were not that stupid. We said we will keep a key with us in our hand and that key will open our wakefulness. The key appears in our physical life in the form of a perfect living master. The perfect living master is a key we ourselves arranged before we came. And when we meet the perfect living master, we think it's an outside agency, outside being helping us. And after a little while we start feeling, no, this is just one form of the master. I'm being helped inside. And gradually you find the outside master and the inside master are the same. Then you find this is an arrangement of the self. The self itself made the arrangement to go back home like this. No, we were pretty intelligent about it. And that's why we become seekers and find our way back. Some have decided to have a longer ride here. Some wanted to get rid of it quickly. It doesn't matter. Time is just a creation here. When we go back, we'll find it was now there, it's now here. It was now at all times. We'll also find that when we say we have no free will, we are mistaken. We have free will. We have experience of free will here. When we find our true self, we find that was a real free will which we exercise through the experience of free will. Only in the middle are we cut off from knowledge of our free will. When we say we have free will here to decide with our mind, we don't have it. That free will is predestined. But when we rise higher, the free will disappears because we can see what's going to happen in advance. Everything predetermined. We're just living a course only in physical ignorance. In ignorance, we find bliss because we say we have free will. With knowledge, the free will disappears. 
at the top knowledge we find it was our free will all the way because there was only one and this was that will that prevailed. It's a beautiful experience. Beautiful experience to go from stage to stage. And take it easy. We have waited millions of years for this opportunity. So don't be in a rush. I have to go in three months back to such or I have to go in three years or something. Take it easy. Go step by step. Enjoy every step. When you start enjoying every step inside, you will start enjoying the whole world around you also. We have come for that. Come for watching the show, witnessing this great show. So don't be despondent. Don't feel that, oh, we are trapped. What are we going to do? We have the key. And the key is that at the right time when we are ready, the perfect living master comes and finds us. Thank you very much.